we're just so thankful for you and thankful, Father, to what you have done for us in our lives and how you sent your son to die on that cross for us. Father, you, you love us so much, and I, and I don't think we're going to truly know exactly what that means 100% until we get to heaven, but Father, you gave your only begotten Son for me and for you and for each and every one that's sitting out here and everyone that's listening online. Christ died for you. I'm so thankful for that, and I just pray, Father, for Jeff as he comes up and presents the Word of God today, Father, that uh, you would just bless that time as well. Give him strength, give him courage, Father. And, and I'm just uh, so thankful that we have uh, the, our praise team who continually comes up every Sunday and sings and praises and worship to God, Father. Father, I say this in Jesus' name, and I just, again, are so thankful for your love. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. If you'll please stand and turn in your hymnals to page 63. Page 63. While you're turning to page 63, uh, Mr. George Herman has a birthday tomorrow, and I know he's shaking his head already just because I said his name. But George is very uh, committed to coming and uh, and being at this church, and uh, let's sing Happy Birthday to him. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear George. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> All right, so if you'll turn to 63. Without you, I fall apart. 
Sure. Really? 
Welcome to the lunchroom hour. Um, don't get to talk, uh, preach too much. And I am here at 10 o'clock, though, so I'll count you as Sunday school class for today, so you can mark that off. So you went to Sunday school. Oh, I need that, so I don't. Yeah, I will be roaming through, so. Um, get this hooked up here. There we go. I'll be on in a second here. Um, I'd like to thank, though, uh, a lot of my family, they couldn't make it, whatever, for whatever reason. But uh, uh, my friend Jeff Shaver is here. Um, he's back in the back row there. Um, there's a th what I'm thankful for, um, Jeff's family um, was instrumental in getting me to come to know the Lord as my Savior. And uh, through his brothers and his, his parents um, and their, their commitment to the Lord, um, have brought me to this point, and so I'm, I'm thankful. For, I'm always thankful for the for what they did, and they're you know we were talking about service and what you could do to uh, further the kingdom of God, and in Sunday school today, and uh, and the Shaver family, you know, they did that part, you know, and so I'm always thankful for that. Um, last week we uh, Roy was up here and he was preaching on the Ten Commandments, and unknown that I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> so if you didn't hear it enough last week, you get to hear it again. So uh, we'll be talking about the Ten Commandments and, um, and, and for that. And I would like to um, kind of give you a little background about it. I like to do that. I like to, when I do my uh, research on the Bible, I like to give you a little bit, thing of what's going on with it. The, the Ten Commandments um, uh, gives us the basis of our laws today. Uh, here, in, especially here in the United States, um, it's, it's part of our legal system. Um, 32 million laws have been written, um, and even with all those laws that are been written, not one of them has improved or even replaced 
what the Ten Commandments gives us. You know, some people, some preachers don't even preach out of the Old Testament saying it's, it, it doesn't apply anymore, but yes, it does. It applies very much so. Um, there was a quote by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, I'm going to have it up here on the board as well. Um, and thankful for it, I go on, is that uh, well, I'd like to thank you uh, to my daughter, Isabella, um, because I'm not computer savvy. Um, I can have to get on, check my emails and stuff like that, uh, look up research stuff, but I'm not doing PowerPoints. I, I wasn't raised that way. I didn't have a computer when I grew up. Um, so that. Um, so if you noticed uh, um, each of the slides now and in, in the rest of the, the slides you'll see um, all have a title to it um, because she said I had to have a title to each thing. So I feel like I'm doing seventh grade, you know, or effective oral speaking here today. So just bear with me. They, you know, she said I had to do that, so they're up there. So, but Abraham Lincoln, he once said about the Ten Commandments, he says, without the Ten Commandments, we wouldn't know right from wrong. It, was, it seems simple, but it's true. And Abe Lincoln was a believer. Um, also, as you, you see the uh, Solomon and what he said, and I'll read it from the Bible. Um, here in Solomon chapter 12, this is what Solomon had to say, starting here at verse 13. Um, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So before we go on, let's open in prayer, and then we'll continue with. So, Lord, thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, how you've um, been with us, and you've been, you've given us your word. We have the complete word now. We have access to you. We are able to pray to you at, at, at whenever we need to. We have us there. Have us today, Lord, as we share from God's word. Use me to effectively teach onto the people that are hearing either here or on Facebook and being able to help strengthen their lives as a believer um, or to become a believer. Pray this, uh, just bless this time. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So for the non-believer um, does not recognize God as their God or maybe you've never confessed God to be your God, but you, 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 know, you, you know who God is. You're not a believer until you do that, until you confess God as to be your God. But, but for the non-believer, um, your actions, you will be judged by what you've done. Whatever you've done on this earth, um, from the moment you're born to the moment you die, um, you're going to be judged on what you've done. Your actions are, are, are that. And you'll, be, you'll have to cover your own debts you have to pay for what you've done. Um, because God is a holy God, and God uh, it re reigns as a judge, and ju judgment will come down on those uh, non-believers for, for what they've done, and then what they've done, they'll have to pay their own debt. But as a believer, you don't have to pay those debts. And that's the great thing about being a Christian, is because when you die, because we all have something in common here, we're all going to die at one point. And so Jesus, he paid that debt. But we don't have to worry about answering for what we've done wrong. Okay? Because J Jesus forgave all that. But um, still, God keeps track of what even a believer has done throughout their lives. There, there is a books that are kept on each person as to what they've done throughout their life. It says so, and I'm not going to have the scripture for that, but it does have, you are going to be judged on those things. Just as much as a uh, non-believer is judged, and their judgment will, they'll face and as, to, as to what level of hell that they will experience, as well as a, a believer, their deeds, um, their, their actions will be judged. Um, in Hebrews uh, 10.17 as you turn up there, it says, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So we, yes, your sins, is another, iniquity is another word for sin, your, your will not be, won't be remembered anymore, right? That, that's forgiven. And then Colossians 2, 
uh, 13 and 14. Let me turn, I have my cheat, cheat notes here. Um, in Colossians 13 and 14, uh, or sorry, 2, 13 and 14, um, it says here, in, your, in you being dead in your sins and your uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwritten, uh, the ordinance that was against us, which was contrary to us, and it took out of the way, nailing it to the cross. So all the sins that you have done as a believer, and yet to probably still do, because we're not, we haven't passed away yet, um, Christ nailed those, all those to the cross. You can't be held accountable for that. You don't, you're not, you know, you'll be, when you go up to heaven and you'll have, it'll be, it's blotted out. It's not there. It's gone. Okay. But here's the question to you, to believers that I have is to think about this. Forgiveness doesn't mean you can't be held accountable. Just because I'm forgiven because I robbed the bank down the street. God can forgive me of that, but my actions, I've still got to pay for what I've done. I'm still going to be judged by what I've done. What you do as a person, maybe someone, it wasn't a law you, you, you disobeyed, but maybe you, you did something to someone that they had to forgive you of that, and that was what the aftermath of what you've done still goes on. You still have to be, it's still, that stuff uh, is going to be, be held accountable to you because of what you've done. And same thing as when you die, all our actions, all our things that we've done, um, the, to the believer, you're, you stand before the Bema seat of Christ, and those, yes, you're forgiven, but what you've done, what you've actions, what you have transpired throughout your life, are, is going to probably level as to what, how placed you are placed in heaven. Just as much as there's levels of hell of your punishment, just as much as there's heaven, there's le levels that you're going to be placed at as to where you're going to serve, how, what you're going to do, and, and what, how faithful you were to him while you're here on earth. This little vapor of time that we have here on earth matters for all of eternity. So those of you that forsake the selling of yourselves together, God wants you to do that. Why don't you come to church? Why don't you worship him? Why don't you do this? Why do you find other activities to do rather than doing what God wants you to do? That that's all comes into play. That all comes in when you die, you will have to give an account of your life, what you've done. So it kind of it's kind of eye opening when you think about that to think that I'm going to have to give an account for what I've how I've acted my whole life. Yes, it is true. Um, so that, that follows you. Um, you're here for a reason. It's not for if you've been given yourself to God. Uh, if you're a, a believer, and one of the terms that is used, I think it's Greek, um, is you're a, it's a doulos, which means that you're a slave to Christ. You, you've given up your freedom um, to do what you want, how you want, act like you want. You've given that up. Okay, that shouldn't be, yet yeah, you still have the free will to do it, but really if you're a follower of God and you want to be holy, you want to do what God says, you are a slave to Christ. You do what he wants you to do, not what you want to do. Um, all right, and Paul wrote in Romans 14.10, I have it up there, but why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou not set thy brother, for we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ? As like I'm saying, that you're going to face that. We're all, going to, as a believer, we're going to face that, and we have to give an account for how we are. Um, and like I said, I was going to talk to you about um, how the Ten Commandments come into play of a believer's life. But we don't, ha we don't, we're forgiven our sins because of what Christ did. Okay, the Ten Commandments is was a guideline and never was a plan of salvation for those. Uh, people back in, in, in the, when the Ten Commandments were written, it wasn't their plan of salvation. It was just a guideline of how to live your life. And it should be our guideline how we should live today. And so if you think about back the time when the time when it was written, um, Moses had, was given the Ten Commandments by God. He came down off the mountain. And what did he see? He saw the people after 40, being gone for 40 days. He was gone for 40 days. He comes back 
Now, many of these people were just released like four or five months ago from being in captivity by the Egyptians. And then miracle after miracle that God performed for them, parting the Red Sea, manna coming down from heaven, um, you know, all these things, that the miraculous things that they, God was able to do for these people. Yet 40 days, Moses is gone. They feel like he's not coming back. And he comes down. And what does he see what they're doing? They're worshiping a calf. They have given up hope. They, that quick, that short period of time, 40 days, and they're already worshiping something else. You know, it's amazing how easily uh, uh, the people can, and what it was, it was a certain group of people that swayed them that way and swayed the whole group to go that way, except for the priests. And so they, they all did that, the Levites. They all, they fought, they got away from God. Even Aaron did that, who was right, you know, on Moses' right-hand man. He even did that. And all, and after God did all that, all they did was complain and murmur about what, you know, because they weren't getting what they their wants meant right there and then. So, um, I just down here. So, God is through this, you know, God allowed the blood sacrifice to cover their sins, but yet now we have Christ has paid our debt. He has done that for us, so we don't have to worry about falling, um, the, you know, doing a blood sacrifice, for, you know, for our sins. God, Christ has forgiven all that. So what, if I were to come down and ask you some questions about the Ten Commandments, what would you say? So we have a picture of the Ten Commandments up there, and you see they're all in order. But if I actually came down in the audience, you know, and asked you a question like, say, have you ever lied? What will you be? A liar. Mm. If I asked you, have you ever stolen anything? You're a what? A thief. Okay. So have you ever disrespected your mother or father, you'd be a what? Be disrespecting God. Because when you disrespect your mother and your father, you're also what? Disrespecting God. Okay? What if I were to say, have any of you used the name of God in vain? Have you ever you say God and, you know, and that, that? Right? Have you ever done that? What would you be called? I know. A blasphemer. So, if I were to come to you and you've done those four things, you're a liar, you're a thief, you're a blasphemer, and you're a, you disrespected God. And then you're going to die one day, right? All of us are going to die. We all share that. Isn't that nice we all share something? You know, maybe not so, so much. But what's going to happen is you're going to go, God, I'm here. Let me in, right? He's going to say, well, you're a liar, you're a thief, you're a blasphemer, you disrespected me. Yeah, come on in. You see, th would you think about that. You were a child once. Have your kids ever lied to you? Have your kids ever told, you know, said, you know, said something bad about you, you know, in a way? Good enough. Um, have they ever stolen something? And what do you do? You punish them, right? Because you, that actions does not, you want that in your home. You don't want that to be part of your home. You don't, you don't want to accept that type of thing, attitude or behavior. So why would God allow you into his heaven? Ask yourself that. That's what the Ten Commandments are for. They're a guideline because we don't do those things. You don't, you don't act that way. You don't, perform, you don't lie. You don't cheat. You don't, you don't take things that are not yours. You don't do those things. Because everything you do, God sees. You think that you can hide away from God. You think because you're by yourself, you can do what you want. No one's going to know what's going on. God knows. God sees. You think God can't see what's going on? He created the world. Why could he not see what you're doing? Okay? So, um, if you ever, I'm getting ahead of myself. Moses, who tried to live a clean life 
and as you know how Moses, you think of Moses, you think of his history of who Moses is, and you know all the great things that he's done. But he even, even tried to live a clean life as he's being used by God. God still could not allow him to look at him. That's that famous song, I don't know if it's actually called that, but the, you know, God looked at Moses through the what? The cleft of a rock. He looked at his, he actually, God turned his back and was able to look at God's back. He couldn't look upon him because if, God, if Moses looked upon God, what would happen to him? He would die because he's so holy. Okay? And so, that, so God was, even as Moses, as, as much as he was as follower of God and how much he's revered in the Bible about how faithfully things that he did for the Lord, um, even him, God could not allow um, him to look at him because Moses knew sin. Moses was a sinner. Just like like you were a sinner. We're all sinners. And so even God couldn't allow that. So he gives us um, the the abilities to want to either follow him or not follow him. He doesn't, you know, make us into this mindless robot so we can just do whatever he programs us to do. He gives us something that they call free will. So we turn to Galatians um, chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Um, we turn there, I'll read that to you. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8, it says this, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall also he reap. For he that soweth in his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. If you were to pull at to yourself things that you've done, things that you do. You, you're going to, whatever you do to yourself, you're going to reap. You're going to, whatever action you take, you're also, there's, with any action, there's a reaction. And so those things are going to come back in your life. They're going to, you wonder why things aren't going right in your life. You wonder why things are such a mess. You know, I can't get ahead. I can't do that. What are you doing with your relationship with God? God wants a relationship with you, but yet he tells you what he expects out of you. And the Ten Commandments are one of those things that he does. He tries to tell you that, how he expects your command, how you to live your life. And that's this is the Ten Commandments as a guideline. Okay? But with that, there are other Ten Commandments. You know, there's ten, you know, ten ways to do this or ten ways to do that. But there are ten commandments of driving. Now, this is one of the things that I, I don't know if everybody experiences driving and aspects of driving, but there are ten commandments of driving. So I'm going to read this. Isabella did change it up on me a little bit. So I'm going to read these to you. The first commandment of driving is thou shalt not wait until the last possible second to merge the lane when the lane is ending. How many people have experienced that? <laughs> now, the next one. How about... Thou shalt not throw away trash out of the window. How many times people throw the, you see people throwing out stuff out of the window? You look on the side of the road. And like that. And you, next one. Um, thou shalt not text while driving. How many people do that? <laughs> you get a ticket for that now. Number four. Um, thou shalt not put makeup on, paint thy nails, curl thy hair while driving. Thou shalt not also do the same thing. Time while driving. I mean, I've seen that, women doing that down the road, doing, getting themselves ready, going on the way to work. It's, I don't know how they do it. Five, thou shalt not leave thy turn signal on when stopped at a light. How many people drive behind someone who had their turn signal on the entire time? Number six, um, thou shalt not pass me on the highway in order to get a couple of car lengths in front of me. How many people do that? I mean, it's, you just, i got to get out there. It doesn't really save you much time. Number seven. Thou shalt not make thy fantasy football lineup at a traffic light. I mean, guys, have you done that? Have you done that? you got to quickly get that in before the game starts. Number eight. Thou shalt not drive with my knees or consume food while driving. Thou may also shall not do both at the same time. When we get in that much of a hurry, you can't hold, drink, and drive at the same time, so you use your knees. Nine. Thou sh- shalt keep thy distance. How many people like to ride people's behinds to their bumpers? I mean, that, I, 
I get annoyed with that when people do that to me. Number 10. Thou shalt not take a selfie or update social media with driving. How many people do that? I mean, who will see other people on their phones while they're driving? That's kind of like a funny thing of I wanted to share with you, kind of break it up a little bit. But yet, we do those things. We do things that just uh, um, kind of can irritate you when you're driving. But Jesus, back to our message, Jesus kind of sums it up. He was asked kind of like what are the two greatest commandments to ever do? What are, can, and he kind of sums up the Ten Commandments in, these, in this saying here in Mark. In Mark chapter 12, it says this in verse uh, 30 and 31. It says this, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. That kind of sums up the Ten Commandments. Because the first five, first four commandments are dealing with the relationship with the Lord. The fifth commandment kind of deals with just your mother, mother and father. And the sixth through ten deal with specific things like stealing and adultery and stuff like that. And so he kind of said, you know, if you can follow these two commandments, all the Ten Commandments you should follow and obey. Put those in perspective and you'll understand how just being committed to your relationship with the Lord opens up blessings from the Lord as well. Um, also, uh, everyone um, serves God. What do you think about... What you, everybody... Let me back up. Everybody serves a God. You, whether it's God, the heavenly God, or your own God. We all serve some kind of God. Some people say they're atheists. Some people say they're agnostic. But guess what? We all do serve a God. Sometimes, Christians, you serve a God other than God himself. Because where you invest your time in, where you invest your money in, what you decide to do rather than doing some service for God is what you've made your God. It could be anything that you Maybe it's television. Maybe it's, you know, social media stuff. You'd rather get on your social media and not read your Bible. And then you, at the end of the day, well, you've done all of your social media maybe requirements, but you didn't spend any time reading the Word of God. You didn't pray. You have just made basically your cell phone your God. There was actually was a guy that actually married his cell phone. You know? It was kind of a funny story, but he actually did that because um, he was such in love with being on his phone all the time. So, um, but there, even with that, I want to share with you a story of a man that lived a long time ago. His name is Jan Hus. Okay, he lived. You see, 1370. You know, roughly, read around there, maybe 1371, I've heard 1369. But anyways, he was a uh, man who grew up poor in, like, at the time, well, our time would be Czechoslovakia, it was something else. But he grew up around in that era, he was very poor. Um, at a young age, um, he wanted to train to become a priest in a Catholic church. Um, and he studied the uh, very good about studying, uh, learning what the, the Bible had to say and studying everything about it. And then he compared the Bible with what the Catholic beliefs were at the time back then. And he started speaking out against the Catholic Church. He was inspired by, you might have heard about this guy named John Wycliffe. Okay. And he, was, he had read his teaching and his influences of that. It was so much that, that John, or Jan Haas, he was such, spoke out so much against it that actually Pope Alexander V wanted him arrested. Okay? And so there was a time, there was a meeting that was called, it was called um, the uh, Council of Constantine. Um, and it was in the year 1415, and they asked him to come share his beliefs. And they, they granted him what they call a safe passage or safe conduct. 
meaning allow him to come without the record not being, he wouldn't be arrested, he would be allowed to come. Well, he took the chance and he wanted to, he wanted to help change the ways of the Catholic Church and, and get them straightened out. And he, and, but it was a trick. As soon as he got there, they arrested him. They asked him to recant everything he said about how the teaching in the Catholic Church were wrong and how, what, they, what they taught. And so he, um, they said, if you recant, then we'll let you go. And, he, and they get to the point where they said, if you don't, we're going to burn you at the stake. Guess what happened? They burned him at the stake. During his time that he was being burned at the stake, um, the fire would, would go, kind of go away from him and it wasn't getting, really getting to him. And then someone went up there, uh, one of the people were watching, because they watched, it was a public thing, and actually threw oil on him. And then the fire just psh, went right up on him. As he was in, being in torment of the flames, he said, forgive them. How many times would, would you have the the nerve to say that to, to, to someone who's carrying out an act um, and, and, and doing that to you, and he said, Lord, forgive them. 68 years later, there was another man that was out, and he spoke against the Catholic Church. His name was Martin Luther. And he started the Reformation of the breaking away from the Catholic Church, and that's now why we have so many different types of Christian churches, you know, today. And so he spoke. So he was willing to live his life to serve the Lord no matter the cost, even giving up his life. for, for the Because he served, he served God and he wanted God's word to go on. He wanted God's word to be preserved, to be cast on to the next generation, to be taught the correct way and not to be influenced so much by people's ideas of what they thought the Bible was. Um, but maybe you're not here, you're not sure where you stand with God. Maybe you don't understand what it is, what is he talking about being a child of God? What does he mean saying about being a follower? What, does he, what, what, do I, what is it that I have to do to know that, you know, he said, I'm going to, to die. We're all going to die. He said that. What does that mean? I'm, when I die, I, it, do you know for 100% chance that I'm going to go to heaven? I, if you don't know that, maybe you don't understand that. Maybe you don't see where, if I walk out and I get in a car accident and I die, am I going to go to heaven? I don't know that. If you don't know that in your heart, how you know you're going to, how am I going to face each day knowing how am I going to get to heaven? There's one thing that you must do. And that is confess God as your Savior. Being able to recognize what he did for you on the cross and verbally saying to God with your mouth. It actually says this in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, I almost had this memorized, I'm trying to do it without it. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that the Lord Jesus, thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You don't get to heaven because your parents were good people and you're a good person. You don't get to uh, just go to heaven because, well, I didn't break all the Ten Commandments. Okay, I... I lived a good life. I didn't go to jail. No. It says right there what you must do in order to go to heaven. Recognize who God is. Recognize who he did for you. Accept that. Believe in your heart. And then as you, as you believe in your heart, you confess it. Who do you confess it to? You're confessing it to God. Now you might have someone beside you that's telling you how to help you through this. But all you have to do is to simply say this to your, out loud, verbally, to God. And guess what? That's your golden ticket to heaven. If you want to borrow from a Willy Wonka movie when you're trying to get the golden ticket, okay? There's your ticket to heaven. But it's a commitment that you must make yourself personally. Everything God, dealing with God, is a personal relationship. It is nothing else. 
And so God is, if you've done that, if you are a believer and you've done that, that is great. But now as I leave with you, and I'm turning it over to Roy, we're soon going to do the communion. Um, we're, you're here. Some of us are older, and some of us are younger. And you think, well, I, I have limitations. I have a job. I have this. I have that going on. And God knows that, and you have to live your life. But if you're a Christian, you must ask yourself, I'm going to give an account to God for what I've done with my life. I'm going to an account of every action that I have done. And if I want to see my reward in heaven to be the most it can be, then I need to start serving him more. I need to start being the person he wants to be. I need to start following what his word actually says. Not, well, everybody else does it, so I can do that. Or it's not going to harm nobody. I can just go ahead and keep doing the sin that I'm doing. You know? Stop. Your actions, other people do see and do notice as a believer. And if you're doing it, they'll think, well, I can do it. Stop what you're doing. Start serving the Lord. Start following what his word has to say. And then you will find your happiness. Then you will find the blessings of God in your life. Not hanging on to what this world has to offer you. So let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Lord, for your word, how it gives and strengthens us. Help us, Lord, that we follow you. Help us, Lord, as we try to be examples for you in following um, the plan that you've laid out for us, that you've given us this life to live for you, not for ourselves, but help us, Lord, to be uh, that for, for you, the, the servant you want us to be. And for those that are in our midst or listening online, help them, Lord, to understand um, their need for salvation, that you have a plan for them. You are, you're, it's not a mistake that they're hearing this, um, that they have the opportunity now to become a child of God. I pray that they'll, they'll come forward and, and do that. Praise to you, Saint.